Well, I introduce you to generative modeling and more concretely on adversarial networks. And as Xavi said, this is a very, very hot topic. And this is not working. Okay. So first of all, what are, I'll go over what are generative models, why generative models, which generative models, and finally, generative adversarial networks. What are they? How they work? What can they do up to the current time? So generative models are basically a kind of, they estimate a probability distribution of our training data points. Up to now we had, these are unsupervised kind of learning. Up to now, remember we had input output data points and we made back propagation to adjust our network to predict those outputs based on those inputs, okay? This way of modeling is based on another approach, is we have these kind of, these data points, 1D data points for instance, and they have some distribution, in this case it's Gaussian distribution, and we want our model to feed that distribution, so change its weights to make the outputs behave the same way as the training data, okay? So this curve would be the distribution estimated by our model, given these training examples. And we again have weights and biases the same way. We will use neural networks to do so because they are very powerful nonlinear mapping functions. In the case of uh, current state of the art generative modeling, working with images, for example, um, it should be as powerful as. You'll see, I go from image world to speech world, like without caring very much about it because we're dealing with data points in deep learning, okay? So we can map many things from one field to the other one now, nowadays. And the thing is, uh, what we want is out of the training examples, our model should estimate the density of those examples such that it has to be able to generate new examples, not memorizing them, but understanding, to say it somehow, because it's not understanding things, it's a machine, but thing is, it has to be able to generate novel samples out of the understood distribution, okay? That's the idea. And we should be able to, out of huge number of images, for instance, generate dogs and things made up, understanding the complex distribution that generated the training data. But it's not memorizing examples, that's the key, okay? It's building like, like a hyperspace of possibilities and every point is one sample, in this case would be an image. And every point would mean maybe all the pixels unrolled to a very huge vector like in the NIST data set. Here we could, be, we could have thousands of dimensions. Why generative models? Well, they can model very complex and high dimensional distributions and it might be good for testing some things that we want to test in, in physics or engineering. Uh, so to modeling distribution is an interesting tool in these fields. Uh, they are able to generate realistic synthetic samples. So this can be useful, for instance, in supervised learning. We talked about lack of data. What if we do some data, to do data augmentation, as Elisa explained yesterday, maybe you add noise to your samples, but what if a generative model understands somehow a kind of distribution of data and it can generate new synthetic samples to um, make another model more powerful in its training? And other things are, for instance, uh, simulate possible features for other learning algorithms like reinforcement learning. Like, as I told you, Yesterday, there's a methodology in machine learning called reinforcement learning. Uh, we're not going into that, but they can be used for that, that kind of algorithms. They can also fill the blanks of data. If you have data with um, some, yeah, some, if you have uh, an image, for instance, with an occlusion, so a part of the image has been removed, you can recover that because they understand what's the structure that has to be followed in that distribution of data. And you can manipulate samples. That's a case of manipulation as well, the occlusion and, and re so replacing the missing patch of data. So you can manipulate samples with the assistance of generative models as they can tell you what to regenerate. You'll see an example, an application example in a few slides. So current most known options are generative adversarial networks. Very, very hot topic nowadays, like very hot topic. And Autoregressive methods like WaveNet, WaveNet will be seen by uh, Antonio. It's a very famous now speech synthesis method. And finally, variational autoencoder that Xavi introduced yesterday, although we're not going into the details of that. 
we're, we're, we're basically stuck to the first two options, okay? So, generative adversarial networks. The idea is the following. We have a adversarial network. This is the, the keyword, adversarial, okay? We have two networks. Network G, generator, G, that's the generative model, and network D, discriminative. And th they have different missions, okay? They fight, basically, because G, G's mission is to make its output distribution the same as the training data distribution. And to do so, it's trying to make D fail in classifying, because D's mission is classify whether the, re the input samples it has, it's a neural network classifying either. If an input sample is real, means coming from training data, or it's fake, meaning it comes from generator model, okay? So generator is, try is maximizing the error of discriminator, making it say, that generator's data is true, and discriminator is trying to discriminate G as being fake, okay? So this is the fighting process. They are making to, they are trying to make the other one fail. And this is why it's called adversarial. So some notation is, we have the networks G and D, and the PDF of P data, training data, the training data points, imagine we have lots of images, for instance, and uh, these are the parameters of the models. The things to the weights and biases of every model, okay, are the thetas. Then uh, x are samples from our real data distribution, distribution, and then z are samples from a prior distribution. It's noise. It's a random vector, and this can be uh, withdrawn from a normal, a multidimensional normal distribution, okay, Gaussian. But it's a random vector. For instance, a hundred-dimensional random vector withdrawn from some distribution, and then G's samples, so G maps Z to its output through its weights. So G's input is the random vector, and it has to map that to our output, which dimensionality is the same as our real data. So in the case of the MNIST image, we would have an output 784 pixels. Okay, that's the output of G, the same amount of dimensions as X. So D network receives X or X hat, X hat is this G's output, okay, and decides whether input is real or fake, and it has to maximize its training to say that X, so real data, is real and the other one is fake. And G is trying to optimize to make D fail, so it's, max it's updating its weights to make D say one, okay? And now we see the process depicted in figures. I think it's clearer. So first we pick a sample for X from training set, show X to D, and update weights of D to say one, okay? Gradient, again, gradient descent, back prop. Then G maps the sample random to the fake example that is trying to imitate the real data distribution. And show X to D, and update weights, so D output, uh, update its weights to output zero in this case. The back prop is just in this, in this section of the whole pipeline. We have G and D. This maps Z to X, gives it to D, D back props and says this has to be zero. And then the last step is we freeze these weights. These are not the, the gradients flow through this network, but don't update anything. We just update in this part when we have Z map and maximize the, and, and put the decision to be one, updating these parameters. So as these parameters update to be zero, these parameters update to, to say one, okay? So this is trying to do the opposite thing, right? And both networks are parameterized to do the opposite thing. So as an analogy, this is like having a counterfeiter trying to make fake money and a policeman trying to distinguish whether the money is real or not, okay? I have a banknote, and I try, as a counterfeiter, I try to, to make it so realistic, though it's fake. And then the key idea is that D has to detect the fraud, and its parameters has to have to be learned to detect discriminative features to detect whether it's real or not. So this optimization is detecting what is real and what is fake. And this is a very important notion because this means that a backprop that goes through D to G happens to be information leaking about what to modify in G to make it more realistic, okay? So G is like correcting by means of what D 
D is complaining about what doesn't look realistic, what looks fake, and G has to be correcting itself slowly to be converging to match the distribution of the real data. It's learning by leaks. And this is why the outputs of G have to be continuous, like images or speech or continuous signals. But for words, like we've seen their categorical classes, it's, there's no notion of slight correction from one, one hot to the other one, because they're you know, orthogonal and very distant. So you cannot go from, I don't know, from chicken to an ostrich uh, in a slight modification. So this is why the output of G doesn't work with categories, but with continuous and real outputs, okay? Because of this, this, this behavior, it has to be slightly correcting because of leaks of information. And here we have depicted a bit the, the process where the counterfeiter first may draw a 100 number on a, on a blank paper and saying this is banknote. And the policeman would leak the information maybe about it's not even green, because it detected that real, a, a real feature would be for the banknote to be green. Then it would say, there is no watermark. And then the counterfeiter would print the, the, the watermark. And it would say, it should be rounded. So by detecting these features, D is optimized to detect what's real or fake. The other one has to be correcting because of these clues that G is giving with its that D is giving with this optimization. G is able to be correcting towards the correct answer. And finally, with enough iterations, and if the counterfeiter is good enough, which means in terms of neural network, if you have enough parameters, if your model is powerful enough, and if you iterate enough epochs, then you might reach the <coughs> most close place to your real distribution. OK? Is everything clear up to here? OK, perfect. So, OK. The final thing about GANs is that we can not only go from noise, but also condition them on labels that we may have. So maybe we could be, rather than mapping just noise, saying noise vector, and we want you to generate images of class dog, or class cat, or class truck, OK? And what this does is we help Z to capture the variability that we don't manage, like uh, perspective and light and stuff like that in the image and sees the deterministic part that says what to print okay and we can also condition on text making embeddings and encoding uh, the sequence in the state of the recurrent neural net so there is a paper I leave it to you the reference published in NIPS recently and about ways of conditioning generative adversarial nets some experiments on how to do it and finally some applications to conclude the, the talk uh, so far, they have been extensively used in computer vision tasks. Um, but recently, we have been working with Antonio and Juan in Telefonica in, uh, in speed generation that's something not tackled yet by GANs. Uh, so you'll see now some applications of generating images. If you train the GAN without conditioning it, with the Z vector of noise, with images from bedrooms, you then pick up during test time, uh, random vectors from that distribution. You map them, and you get these kind of images. Okay, You're basically like walking around in that random space by picking random samples, and this is what gets generated. You can also condition it, as I've told you, and you can write the text of what do you want. So in this case, there's caption to image synthesis so that we can tell it, this white and yellow flower have thin white petals and a uh, round yellow stem. <coughs> and then this gets printed like you want, OK? And the same with birds, a small bird with a black head and wings, blah, blah, blah. And so this is what you can get done nowadays currently by these models. This is, plant, this is uh, generated by this kind of, of powerful models. Uh, also, similarly to what word to back does is in this conditioning world, in the, in the random space of Z, you can get the vector of images from men with glasses, uh, vectors of men, and subtracting the vectors of men and adding the vectors of women. And then you would get these kind of images of women with glasses. So in this space, the understanding is that some dimensions of the noise capture some key features in the image. So it understands somehow mm -hmm that glasses have to be 
uh, on the face, uh, this kind of shape, etc. And you can play with those dimensions in the vector arithmetically to get meaningful things like this. Also, super resolution, uh, new state-of-the-art results on a very decimated image. This is by cubic interpolation. I think you've all seen that. This is an intermediate neural net, uh, quite sophisticated, but not reaching very, very nice results, or not as nice. Well, nice results, but not as nice as these ones, which are the best ones, because of the GAN working process that is, rather than Normally, you work with the optimization function mean square error to predict real values, okay? But the problem it has is if we have a space of many possible natural images, mean square error would average them all. This would be its optimum, the mean of the images. But GAN rather chooses a possible future, okay? A possible future would be some of these points in the manifold. It's not like an averaging. That's why the image with the MSC objective is blurry, and there are not th those details, and GANs make those details. And finally, oh, and here is an example of image editing, though I don't know if we have enough time. Okay, this is quite impressive. <laughs> See, okay. By adding some color strokes. <laughs> Sorry, you're edit editing with the assistance of a GAN, you're telling what do you want, what the color, if there is no image and to begin the GAN with, is suggesting or generating or images based on the conditioning you're giving. The best satisfy the user in the case of interactive image generation, our what you do is you start generation. sketching shapes. The window it, on the left it, shows it the has been trained to detect the uh, shapes, colors, and stuff, and it right generates based, based on um, understanding that, that the you're sketching some kind of shape, so it gives Let's similar things to those shapes, to those colors, etc. Your first printing green with green, it gives you these green you landscapes, and then you apply I think now it's the sketch of the mountain. Let's sketch a mountain. Yes, the shape of a mountain. Okay, it gets to generate a mountain because it's seen examples of mountains and it understands that this shape is something sky. similar to a mountain. So this is what it gives. The blue sky, the snow afterwards, painting white. And finally, let's put some well, snow on the paint. mountain yeah. for a perfect scene. It will suggest there has to be snow, and stuff like that. Okay. Well, and last. And our current progress has been on generating waveforms, and we've achieved generating speech with female voices. And now the main work is on making the correct text-to-speech synthesis, and this is my current line of research. So I wanted to state it here, because up to this point, there's no speech generation or audio gen So there's no other generation field rather than images, or, well, yeah, some physics simulation, I think, with GANs, but uh, 1D signals. Ha Speech signals and audio signals haven't been, haven't been produced yet by GANs, as far as we know. And some caveats about this to finish. Uh, where's the downside of GANs? Because GANs seem to be th those cool things that do everything very nice and stuff. But you have to know they're very, 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 very hard to train. And because you're not just optimizing towards a minima of your loss function. You're making both networks to be equilibrated during a battle and they have to reach what's called Nash equilibrium in game theory. So it's a subtle point that's not a minima in the space. And this is quite hard. So you have to keep balance between both networks. And here, if you ever have some interest in playing around with GANs and doing generative things, here you have a page with some clues and tricks and tips about what to do to stabilize somehow GANs training. And an open problem is the evaluation of the generation quality, because up to the current point, the generation has to be evaluated subjectively by looking or hearing the samples, but there's no objective metric yet. There's no, no way to know, okay, the loss is going well, because as I'm telling you, the loss is not like a minimization problem, okay? And there's no objective metric yet to establish that how this can work better or worse. So this is important, and it's an open research problem in the GAN community. Well, thanks, and I strongly recommend this reading about, if you ever have interest about generative adversarial networks by the inventor of them, good fellow, because it, it's an overview of generative modeling and more completely about how GANs work, tricks and tips and stuff. And it's very, very worth. Thank you. <laughs>